Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to see all of you, and I've really enjoyed our conversations last night at both the uh, cocktail hour and, uh, and dinner. So uh, uh, I, just, I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about myself and my journey uh, and how I got to Bloom. Uh, you know, I, I joined Bloom uh, at the beginning of last year, and I like to tell people that uh, I was happily retired from GE after working at GE 33 years and really not looking for work, but I got a call and they said, hey, we're, we're moving into the marine space and we need someone to help lead it. My last role at GE was leading uh, the, the GE marine business out of London. Um, and I, that really intrigued me because, you know, having worked in the marine space, it was apparent that the marine industry is facing a huge challenge in terms of weaning itself off of heavy fuel oil. Uh, Rick alluded to it as, you know, waste energy that, uh, or a waste product, some of the worst thing that, thing that you can uh, burn. And emit not, not just CO2, but uh, heavy sulfur content and heavy metals. It's just, it's just really not a sustainable uh, uh, fuel for the marine industry. And, and everybody now recognizes that. And I thought, I'd been following Bloom for a while, um, and I thought, wow, this is really intriguing because I was very familiar with the incumbents in the marine space, which are uh, the inter internal combustion engine uh, providers. And you know, the, what we, we differentiate uh, in terms of our fuel cell is the fact that we have no NOx, SOx, particulate matter, or a negligible methane slip. We are also much more efficient, 20 to 30% more efficient uh, than internal combustion engines. And that's important because that means you have to load less fuel on a vessel. Um, and then probably the most important thing is in talking to customers is future-proofing uh, their vessel. Um, there is, um, there has been a very large and quick update uh, uh, adoption of LNG uh, over the recent years. But there's a lot of debate and question as to what is the life of LNG as a marine fuel? How long can we continue to use it given that it still is a fossil fuel? And there's, it's really uncertain in terms of where the marine industry will ultimately go in terms of net zero carbon fuels, whether it be uh, green methanol or whether it be ammonia. What I think is probably our biggest differentiator is our platform can run today on LNG. And today, LNG, uh, the amount of power needed for LNG vessels is about four to five gigawatts per year uh, over this 10-year period that we're looking at. Uh, but we also are positioned to run on wherever the market goes in terms of net zero carbon fuels. So uh, whether, that be a, a, whether that be green methanol, ammonia, or some other net zero carbon fuel, we are going to be positioned and we will make the investment uh, when required so that we, we, can, uh, we, we can run off of any fuel wherever the market goes. So let me talk a little bit about our progress. So and many of you that have been following Bloom probably remember that we signed a joint development agreement with uh, Samsung um, about two years ago. And this was kind of our first foray. This happened before I started, uh, but it was our first, Bloom's first foray into, in, into marine. And <clears throat> we've done a tremendous amount of engineering work to basically, uh, with SHI, develop a fully powered SOFC vessel, which was really interesting work Carl and his team put a lot of man hours into that. Um, but, you know, the concern or the problem is, is that the marine industry is very conservative. And they are very much a show me industry. And the likelihood of launching in the near term a fully powered SOFC vessel, particularly on something the size of an LNG carrier, is probably pretty small. So we made a pivot. Um, beginning of last year, and we said, hey, let's, um, let's explore the cruise market. And we started to get tremendous feedback from um, our discussions with the cruise market and saying, hey, what we really like about fuel cells is we could potentially run our hotel loads when we're in port 
you know, to avoid having any sort of particulate matter or emissions when they go to some of these more pristine destinations. And we think that's a terrific application for uh, fuel cells. So we have made really fast progress since the beginning of last year. We completed the um, design of the marine power module, which you saw today. We have uh, completed the testing, including the tilt test that you saw at the technology showcase today. We signed a contract with uh, Chantier de Atlantique in June of last year, and we have all, and that's a 150 kilowatt system that will go on a World Europa MSC vessel. That equipment is already in France. It'll be installed uh, at the, uh, in July, August of this year, and it will be on the water uh, in the third quarter of this year. So really moving fast and rapidly, and we think that uh, that project with Chantier is going to be a huge catalyst in terms of gaining recognition uh, in the marine industry that fuel cells are a very viable power source uh, as, a, as an alternative to the, uh, the incumbents. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're working with um, Chantier uh, and a number of other uh, cruise operators on doing what I'll call the next generation design, which would be a one megawatt design. Our intent is to have that completed and ready for shipment in 2023. And then the follow-on uh, follow in terms of a product plan would get to 10 megawatts. So if you see a, a large cruise ship, uh, typically their hotel loads in terms of the power requirement is, is at that sort of power level, 10 megawatts. Um, we're not, we're not uh, abandoning the other segments um, in terms of freight carrying vessels. Uh, I had a meeting earlier this week with one of the oil majors. They are very... Uh, uh, interested in replacing a one to five megawatt uh, generator uh, on some of their tanker ships. Um, and we're also working with a number of LNG carrier operators to do something similar uh, to replace generators. So we think on the freight carrying vessel side, similar to, uh, similar to the, uh, uh, the cruise side, it's gonna be a partial power application. Could we do something like a fully powered vessel in the future? Yeah, it's possible, but it would probably uh, require uh, a hybrid type approach, potentially marrying uh, our system uh, with either uh, uh, a, a battery uh, or potentially a, uh, a reciprocating solution as well. So really good progress moving fast on the marine side. Um, let me switch hats here. Now, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my second role, which is the international job. Um, I got a call from KR, I guess it was probably November of last year, and said, hey, I'd like you, I'd like you to do your, the international role in your spare time. I said, sure, why not? That sounds great. And actually, I, I'm really excited about this because um, when you look at what, we, what we've accomplished in 20 years, you know, a lot, a lot of good penetration in the United States, five years of great success in terms of building up South Korea. But when you look beyond that, it's a white space, right? And we, I don't, we don't think that South Korea was a unique opportunity. We think there's many more South Koreas out there. And as KR said, we are laser focused on Europe right now. And why is that? Europe, when it comes to energy security, decarbonization, and potential a need for resilient uh, alternate power, there is no other market that has a greater need. With the Ukrainian crisis, the whole energy uh, equation uh, and supply chain you know, has been completely disrupted. The way governments are thinking about policy has changed dramatically. As an example, Germany, uh, as you know, uh, has had decided some time back to wean itself from nuclear and, and, and coal power. So heavily relying on gas. It is impossible for them to not have an economy that runs on gas. About 50% of their households, 50% of their CNI run on gas. What they're gonna have to do, and I'm sure you're aware of this through the news, is they're gonna have to find alternative suppliers of gas. What does that mean? Prices are likely going to be higher. What does that require? It requires more efficient technologies like 
balloon fuel cells, particularly in a combined uh, heat and power uh, sort of system. Uh, the, the, the second thing is um, reliability and resiliency. You know, even, even a few months ago, before the Ukrainian crisis, you go talk to people in Europe about fuel cells, and we say, hey, we're, you know, we're resilient, reliable power, your grid goes down. Um, you know, we can, we, we're always on and we're there for you. And they say, we don't really have that problem in Europe. But now, with the Ukrainian crisis, all of the solar, uh, uh, solar and wind uh, projects are being accelerated. And it's really, uh, customers are starting to say, we don't really know if the past, the future is going to be the same as the past, because the grid now, in terms of where the generation is happening, is the, the, the scope of that is changing dramatically. And it's starting to put in a question mark, is, w will we have resilient power off the grid uh, going forward? The, this, the last thing I would say is that um, there is a number of places in Europe where uh, Sherilyn talked about time to power, where if you want to go put a data center in, as an example, Ireland, you might have a three to seven year wait. And so they're, 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 we're having a number of those discussions throughout Europe where either because of lack of power generation or the, um, because of dis distribution shortfalls, um, a Bloom solution looks extremely attractive. Let me tell you specifically um, what we are doing. Uh, so we got our first win in Italy uh, in April of this year. It's a one megawatt system. That system is actually already in Italy and being set up. Um, and uh, the, we have a, a, we're gonna go through a trial period of 12 months with an opportunity to expand that to a 15 megawatt system, which would be a combined heat and power or CHP system. Um, we think that's our first in, in Europe. We think there's a lot to follow. We're working with a partner in Italy that we think that like this customer, is very in interested in future proofing um, uh, their system as SNAM looks to bring hydrogen uh, into the region uh, in, in this part of Italy. Um, let me talk a little bit about UK. So um, we are working with Conrad Energy. We had an announcement uh, uh, probably the la end of last year where we we're working with Conrad, who's interested in doing uh, behind the meter uh, resilient uh, energy solutions in the UK. Um, we are working on a number of deals, including Teladata uh, that I think was mentioned in the announcement. Uh, they have, a, Conrad has a broad portfolio uh, of energy projects, and their interest is in, uh, is in also including uh, bloom fuel cell platforms for uh, future, -proofing, uh, future proofing needs. Um, let me go back to Germany for a second. We've got a lot of activity going on in Germany. We've got an 18 megawatt project that we're working on. It's a data center uh, uh, project, CHP. Again, this is a grid, a grid access uh, issue. It's really driving uh, the value proposition, but our uh, cost of electricity is, is very competitive uh, with the grid. Uh, and then um, we are working also with a partner in Germany. Where we're working on a number of smaller systems, and similar to the system in Italy, uh, the, these, these first phase systems, uh, once we prove our, uh, our performance in terms of, uh, of efficiency and ele uh, electricity output, uh, we, we're going to be really well positioned for another uh, 30 megawatts of power just for those four uh, opportunities. In all of these markets, we are developing significant pipelines. And all of that that I've talked about so far is SOFCs. As you're probably aware that um, hydrogen is also uh, top of mind in European countries. Spain is looking to be uh, a hydrogen leader in Europe. Uh, we have a uh, discussion underway with a partner uh, to, to uh, position ourselves uh, in Spain. Policies uh, like in the UK, they just announced uh, two months ago that they're upping uh, their, their investment in hydrogen from five gigawatts to 10 gigawatts by 2030. So we're in discussions uh, with, uh, with uh, potential partners uh, in the UK. Same goes in France and Germany. So a lot of activity. I'm, I'm extremely uh, bullish on Europe. Um, as KR said, uh, I'm gonna be moving there with my family. 
Uh, I can't wait to be back in the marketplace uh, and, and be on the ground, because I think it's really going to be a tremendous opportunity for us. So listen, thanks for listening. I think uh, we're going to turn it over to Greg and the capacity and, and uh, cost uh, panel. Thanks again.